once again. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, as uh, I've been introduced that I'll be talking about the Java-based library Trivio. Uh, here's my Twitter handle and also the hashtag for the rest of the conference. Please use both of them if you want to tweet about this talk or have questions or anything in the future as well. So without any further ado, let me get started. Just so that this presentation is smooth for both you and me, I've put together these slides and they are live on this uh, URL. So I've already asked the organizers to share the URL with you, but in case you haven't received it, then please take a note of this uh, bit.ly link and or the QR code, whichever is uh, easier for you. You can download the PDFs. That's when you get the clickable links, but you could also just browse through the presentation uh, in the browser itself if you don't want to be clicking on any links. Um, so I'll wait for a couple of seconds before uh, we move on to the next slide so you can make a note of the URL and get to the slides while I'm at it. Also at any point in time, if you cannot hear me well or if I'm going too fast, or if the slides are not clear or anything is not clear, please let us know, or at least let the organizers know so they can speak to me and I can, I can make the amendments. Okay, so let's get started since you must have already made a note of this by now. So a little bit about myself. Um, and uh, as you can see from all of these shout outs, uh, these talk about my past present uh, uh, and well, past and present. And uh, uh, in short, I'm a freelance software data and machine learning engineer. Uh, I primarily write code in Java, but uh, these days with uh, all the data and machine learning adventures and endeavors, um, I also write code in other programming languages, including Python uh, and some other JVM languages as well. Um, in my day job, I say I help strengthening teams and helping them accelerate in their development process. If you would like to know more about me, then there's a link at the bottom of the slide. Um, please go ahead and click it and you can read all about my, my work and my current activities. Uh, this is just a standard disclaimer I have with my presentations. Um, it's to say that everything that I'm sharing here are just my ideas and guidelines to things um, and your own uh, experiences may differ. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm human being at the end of the day, so I'm fallible, I make mistakes. And so apologies in advance in case I've um, you know, made some mistake or m m missed out on something. Uh, the other thing I also want to met, let you know is that um, we are not, we are gonna be just skimming through the surface of this topic. We are not gonna go in depth into, into the topic itself. So uh, you will see that there's a lot of uh, details that have been skipped for deliberate reasons, but there's been a lot of resources provided with these slides as you will see uh, that will help you do this research on your own, at your own pace and your own time. Uh, another uh, citation that I'd like to also make is that I've used uh, images and other artifacts in this presentation that are created by other authors and creators and they remain the respective authors and creators and I thank them for their creation. So we have a small bit of an agenda today. Uh, I'll start off with a little bit of introduction then we'll go into the, into the main topic of the talk. There'll be a demo or two, depending on how much time we have, and we'll close off with uh, sharing resources and some summary points. And if there's some time, we could also go into a short Q&A session. So without um, any further ado, but without uh, thanking the organizers and you, you and the team behind the, uh, this, this event, it wouldn't be a, a good, good start. So I'd like to thank Urban, who's been in constant contact with me, his team who's organized this event since uh, I don't know when you started organizing it and you, uh, the attendees that uh, has put your 45 minutes aside and trusted me with this topic. Um, and um, I'm hoping that we will enjoy the rest of the 40 odd minutes that we have uh, with, between us. So we all know we are celebrating 25 years of Java this year and there's been a great blog post written by Alexa I uh, highly recommend you go and read it and also share it with others. And you can find out all the great apps that have been written in the last 25 years. Um, and hopefully you'll get insights into what's to come in the coming years. So let's get started. As I mentioned, we're gonna do a little bit of introduction. 
So um, before we even get started, it's good to get to know the pronunciation of things right. And so uh, this is a fun fact I found on the documentation section of the site. And um, this is how you pronounce the library. It's Tribio, but uh, I think uh, even looking at the word itself, it's easy to, to remember. So it's three syllables. And this is what it actually means uh, in Latin. So something to remember throughout this presentation and eventually when you start using the library and you know, talking to somebody else about it as well. Another um, thing to know is that, um, and it's an important uh, in piece of information, is Tribio has, was incepted in the machine learning research group, which is part of the Oracle Labs. And it's a tried and tested library since 2016. That's when it was uh, roughly, that's when it was incepted. And so you can see that there were many other libraries that were incepted around that time or later on. So there is a bit of a history behind Tribu as well. Another uh, event to know of is that this uh, company, I think it used to be a startup uh, called datascience.com has been acquired by uh, Oracle and it's now integrated into Oracle Cloud since May 16, 2018. So let's get started with uh, Tribu, the library itself. Um, the first thing you'll ask me is, um, it's an open source library and um, in these days, um, how do I, uh, how, where do I find its source code and how do I clone it, how do I fork it? And so this is how you would go and clone the library. This is the, the repository address. Um, but I would suggest don't just clone and fork, go ahead and uh, click on watch and star as well because that will help you not only show your appreciation for the library, but also keep you in tab with all the current activities that are going on, the issues that have been raised, the pull requests that have been raised, the comments and the conversations and everything that goes on in, in between. So since it's a Java-based library, you can use it in your applications right away. If, and if you, if you use Maven as your build tool, uh, I switch between Maven and Gradle, but uh, if I use Maven as a build tool, then just these six lines of XML snippet inserted into your pom.xml will enable uh, Tribio into your application. And we'll see further uh, with some examples and demos how we can go about using this. And as mentioned earlier that if you're a Gradle user, then you have a solution for that as well. It's a single liner. Uh, of course, there are these commented lines um, again, if, if it's for Groovy, then this is how you enable the transitiveness. Uh, if it's for Kotlin, then there's another flag for that. Um, and these are optional, just, you just need that one line implementation uh, for the dependencies uh, flag to work. So now that I've shown you how to integrate it into your application, but before doing that, you want to learn a little bit about it, right? Because just now, uh, we are on a clean slate with regards to this library, but let's get started learning about uh, Tribu. So the, the, the folks that put together the library did a great job with documentation and I'm quite picky about these things, but I've noticed that, um, that there, there's a whole extensive amount of documentation on, and they've been categorized into various uh, sections. Like for example, you have documentation on the features, the architecture of the library, a package overview of all the different uh, packages that are available for us to use as Java developers. Uh, and then there's also security consideration documentations. Uh, and uh, finally, our lovely Java docs have also been accompanied with the library and why wouldn't it be? Because it's a Java library, right? As I had mentioned earlier, uh, they did a great job with documentation and they have provided additional tutorials uh, to go along with it. So if you're familiar with uh, machine learning, and these are not just the only uh, uh, things that we can do with, uh, when you're training a model or when you're building a model. Um, there were many others as well, but these, there, were tuto there are tutorials available on these uh, machine learning uh, processes, uh, namely classification, regression, clustering, anomaly detection. And the configuration is, is not a specific to machine learning process, but it's specific to Tribio, the library. We will cover we won't cover that in this section, but there are uh, resources available for that if you'd like to go further with it. Now, I'm sure during the talk and maybe even before the talk, and of course, at the end of the talk, you will have a lot of questions, right? But um, there, have, there has been thought given on this. And so they, the, the, the folks that put together the library 
have a frequently asked questions section categorized into two different sections at the moment. And then of course, if you have questions and they're compelling enough, they might even get added to this section. So please go and have a look at it before you raise any questions because maybe one or more of your questions might already get answered from looking at this section. So let's get started with the, what are the features of the library, right? This is something you would like to know. So Trivio is based on, on, on four fundamental uh, qualities, you may call it traits or founding stones, whichever you want to call it. Uh, firstly, written in Java, and because it's a Java-based library for Java and JVM languages, type safety comes right out of the box. So you, you have a type safe library that you can use um, with good confidence. Um, the second, and, and it really depends on which other things you consider second or third or fourth, but let's pick up provenance. Now, uh, what does provenance mean? So, so Trivio tracks uh, all the processes and steps that take place right from the start to the end of a machine, uh, of a model building process and, and tracks metadata about these steps. And this is classified as or uh, called uh, provenance uh, in this, in this uh, sense. And of course, the meaning of provenance is that uh, finding background information and, and tracking it and, and storing it. Um, in my view, this is a step towards explainability. We'll cover that a little bit more, uh, hopefully when we get towards the um, demo uh, sections. Uh, now, the other two uh, components, algorithms and inter interoperability, are kind of overlapping. So you will agree with me that no machine learning library is complete without uh, the presence of algorithms, right? So Trivio has both native algorithms that is built into the library itself, but for the ones it doesn't have, it bridges the gap by interoperating or interacting or interfacing with other libraries. And we will see that in the, in the subsequent slides. Um, and that's where the interoperability comes in. And, and hence I mentioned cohesion there, uh, which uh, many of you might be familiar with already. Uh, looking a little bit more into the algorithms, because uh, obviously when you're talking about machine learning libraries, that is the fulcrum, that is the core of, of it. You know, we, we're doing machine learning, machine learning, we're creating machine learning models so that we're able to apply uh, algorithms on data and create a model that helps us in the inferencing process. So these are the five categories of uh, algorithms and for the categories that are missing or in your uh, view or in your instance, you can always interface those algorithms into Trivio using the interfacing protocols and conventions documented. The link on the top right corner will lead you to that section in the documentation that will show you how you can interface Trivio with uh, your algorithms with, with Trivio and then bring them into Trivio so that you can um, use them in your applications. So the five categories of algorithms are general predictors, the classification algorithms, the regression algorithms, anomaly detection, clustering, um, and so forth. So we'll have a quick look into each one of these as we go through. So you get familiar with uh, what these algorithms are and we won't go in depth into them because this is just an introductory talk, but the documentations on the site will help you go through them in detail. So the general predictors are comprised of, uh, of native uh, algorithms, which are, of mag, uh, which are of these types, bagging, random forest, and k-nearest neighborhood. Uh, and the neural networks feature comes from, from TensorFlow library. And the classification one, again, has a bunch of uh, native components. And uh, there's four others that are bridged through these different libraries that you can see, libsvm, xgboost, liblinear. And some of you might be already familiar with some of these from the Python and R world. Um, and if you've been using any of these, then they are similar in, in, in nature here in the Java world as well. Same for the regression one, uh, deter to the classification one minus a couple of uh, algorithms that are not uh, regression related. Um, and then, uh, it's the same external uh, bindings or interfacing or interoperability for the, for the algorithms that are not present in the native uh, sphere. For clustering, it's built in natively. It's the key means um, algorithm. Uh, and for anomaly detection, it's been linked to an external uh, library. Uh, it's one class SPM. 
So if we look a little bit closer into interfacing, uh, which we've seen already in so many instances now, uh, these are the different components or external libraries or external packages that Tribu connects with. Uh, in, except in the case of PyTorch and scikit-learn, you can only load those models into Tribu for inferencing purposes. You cannot do any training yet because that's yet to be built uh, on the other end. But for the other components, those, those libraries are available for training and inferencing purposes. So uh, with that, why don't I show you a little bit about how Tribio is used or how Tribio can be used. So I'm gonna quickly switch to my uh, uh, browser. And uh, actually before I do that, let me talk you through what I am going to be showing you. So there's, there's code on GitHub that you can use to do the demos that I'm doing today. Um, there's also notebooks that are available on those links that I've shown below here. And you can browse through the notebooks and you can see what, how Tribu is interacting and what responses it's giving to the various uh, data, the, uh, the machine learning processes and, and you can study the outputs and you can get an understanding of how to use the library as well because implementation output and annotations or to rich text documentation of those implementations are provided in the notebook. You'll also see in a little bit what a notebook is and how a notebook works in case you're not familiar with it. For those who are familiar with it, I'm sure uh, you'll find it a piece of cake to understand, but for the ones who are not familiar with it, it's something to look, about, to look into. So um, the, the demo environment that I have is going to be a browser-based environment in the first instance. And the browser-based environment is gonna be talking to an underlying Docker container, or it could even be a native environment. Um, and it's basically gonna be fetching a notebook that's on the, uh, on the server, that's a Jupyter server. Um, and so now if you see the notebook uh, will contain, and we will see in a little bit, but I'm just giving you an illustration in, in uh, beforehand, will contain Java code, uh, uh, a rich text annotation around it, and also outputs. In this instance, we don't have any visualizations, but in general, uh, notebooks can contain all of these. Um, now the notebook is hosted by the Jupyter environment, or uh, the Jupyter server, you call it. And in the Jupyter server, in this instance, now you might know that Jupyter actually is meant to run only Python, Julia, and uh, R uh, uh, code bases and R-based notebooks and, and Python-based notebooks. Um, but Jupyter environment is quite open and extendable. So if you write a kernel, which is like an in language interpreter or a language compiler, whatever, whichever way you look at it, then you can actually uh, enable the Jupyter environment to uh, parse and run your code or, uh, of your code of the language of your choice, depending on the kernel, uh, uh, and then serve that into a notebook and, and use it. So we will see in a second what that means. But in this instance, we have a Java, iJava kernel, it's called iJava kernel, but it's actually a Java based kernel that enables us to interact with the Jupyter environment or run a Java code in a notebook in the Jupyter environment. And you can see over here from the bottom section of the diagram that the kernel is interacting with Tribu and other Java li libraries, and it's running on, and this instance for this demo, I've chosen Graal VM as my base uh, JDK. Uh, or JVM, uh, but in your instance, you can also choose another JVM JDK depending on your choice. So I spoke a little bit about notebook and again, for those who are familiar with it, you already know what a notebook is and you used it. But for those who don't know what a notebook is, think of it as best of both worlds. When I say both worlds, what do I mean? If you're used to the, the old way of developing and we still do it now, so it's not an old way, but the original traditional way of developing is what do we do? We write code, we build it, we run it and we see the output, right? Or we have the REPL based environments which uh, are getting more and more familiar uh, and more and more common among developers since a whole number of years and actually REPL based development existed since 1950s, uh, some say. In a REPL based environment, you type in a line of code, you get an output, you type in another line of code, you get an output, and you can actually save all of that in, into, an, into a session. And you'd reload that again. So the next time you load again, you see the code and the output. You may not have these sessions running, but at least you can see the code and output. But there is no 
annotations around that uh, those actions there are no visualizations in that uh, in that file that you save similar with with the traditional code build and run flow we only have code and output and there's an option if you want to save the output nobody does that uh, the code is obviously saved it's usually compiled um, and and there again there is no rich text annotation or visualization illustrating or narrating the output that has that has been generated whereas a notebook is a best of both worlds and all those things that are not there in the REPL and the code build run environments are there in the notebook environment so you can write write code you can execute it you can see the output you can write rich text annotations around those outputs some of the outputs can generate visualizations but you can also bring in external visualizations into your notebook and embed it into the rich text and save all of that as one file and then reload it again the next time and you can see what uh, the what what were the outcome what was the outcome of that execution and then in the notebook you can just like the REPL can can run a single cell at a time or a single line at a time or a, a group of cells at a time or the whole notebook just like you would do in the code build run process so uh, this is the best of both worlds of notebooks i won't spend too much time on it as a video link there which you can look at again to understand how it works but we will be seeing the notebook in a second or two so this is what's going to be happening in a few seconds i will be running the docker container which will kick off the jupyter uh, uh, server which will then host the notebook and we will see it appear in the browser um, and then there are other things to note uh, if you are more java familiar uh, docker familiar then you can also uh, log into the session again uh, through another means and that is also provided here um, i'm also mentioning here how you can get to the tutorials folder where the notebooks are um, but these are just some things to remember and you'll get more familiar with it once you use the uh, the demo in a second or two so this is what your notebook's going to look like i've overlaid two different screenshots here uh, we're going to be looking at a classification uh, problem uh, which is uh, a very uh, simple flower classification problem it's three types of classes that is three types of flowers and the flowers have four features that's um, petal length petal width sepal length sepal width if you're already familiar with this um, data set from uh, past experience then you already know the iris uh, data set and and that's the name of the the notebook that we'll be looking into in a second and so uh, let's get ready with it so let's get started so let me pull up my console and so as i mentioned to you i'm going to be running the notebook um, at any point if you don't um, if i'm going too fast or what i'm showing is not clear please stop me and let me know so i can uh, rectify so let's run the the docker container and as you can see it's kicked off the docker container it's because the docker image is already on my machine it doesn't need to download it but in your in, in your case you'll it'll have to download it the first time and once you have it running then it opens up the container in the browser just like you see here and in our instance it'll show us the con contents of the the, the, the container and, and we don't need to look into any other folder other than this folder trivio because that's where our tutorials are so i'm going to increase the font size by a little bit uh, and then i click on trivio and then there are subfolders in it again we don't need to open any other subfolder but the tutorial stuff folder and then when i click on it then you can see there's a whole lot of notebooks here about five of them then there are other files in here one of them is a data file that we need for one of our notebooks you'll see in a second and then there's a whole lot of jar files here then and not all the jar files are needed but at least we need a couple of them for our, our notebook i think it's the json jar file and the classification experiments jar file again you will see from inside the notebook already which jar files are needed so without any further ado let's open up this notebook so as i was mentioning to you earlier this is a, a jupyter uh, node uh, environment loading java based uh, code uh, with the help of the ijava kernel and so there's java code that will be embedded in this notebook and you'll see the outputs of it and you'll see it running uh, one after the other and there's rich annotation so this is the and there are the, the this this notebook is actually from the Tribio uh, repo and the folks have done a great job by putting all these nice annotations and descriptions in here um so like so when i was saying rich text this is the 
markdown rich text that you can put here. In some cases, you can also put, uh, and we haven't done that here. You can also embed it with images. Um, so by, when you have a Java notebook like this, you, this is what you do to enable. So because it's, it's Java, we need to import classes. And how would you do that? You need to import it from somewhere, right? So they'll be stored in something like a jar file and they might be stored in multiple jar files. So you can import or you can load jar files into the, into the space by using this percentage jars. Uh, we call it magic in the Python, uh, in, the, in the Jupyter environment. And the iJupyter notebooks call them as um, magic. And so it's very easy to use. You just say percentage jars and you put the location of jar file. And then uh, in this instance, you can see it's already been executed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clear all the output so you know I'm not um, you know, showing, I'm showing you something from scratch. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run this, this line. And I run the line by doing shift and enter, or you could just keep your cursor on there and click on the run uh, button here, and that'll do the same thing. Now the jars have been loaded into memory. I need to import those packages. So I just do a shift enter, and the packages are getting imported. If there's an error, it'll tell you in the next line. See, that's the beauty of, of, uh, of this. So let me scroll this a little bit to the top so you can see now my current focus is on this line. Um, so now in Tribio, there are many steps you got to do, right? You got to first load the data into a class uh, or into an object and then use uh, Tribio packages uh, to do the training on it. So we have, a, we have a raw data set, which we downloaded earlier, uh, as you see here. Uh, I am not going to do this because I've already done it. I can show it to you here. We have this data set here. If I click on it, you can see this is the raw data set. It's got five columns here. The first four columns are the features which we talked about earlier. Uh, petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width. And the fifth column is the name of the species. And we'll see in a second that will come to light. So now going back to the notebook, you can see we need to start loading that data set into Tribio. So the way we do it is we have a CSV loader. Um, a class called CSV loader, and we need to uh, create that class with this label factory. It'll be clear in a second why we are doing that. So um, because we want our types to be, uh, our results to be typed, we, we want to say what, is the, what, what was the type that'll be best handling the, the, that column. And so now looking at this line here, we will see, we're seeing that, um, and you already seen in the data set, right? It does not have names of columns. It only has got comma separated values. So we need to help the CSV loader identify that. And so what the way we're doing it is uh, we specify an array that has got the names of all the columns. So the names of all the five columns. And so, yes, I, I actually incorrectly said it's sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, not the other way around. And the last column is called species. Um, now, once we've done that, we specify, we, we use the CSV loader, which we instantiated earlier. Uh, we use the load data source method. We use the name of the uh, file that is we've already seen earlier. It's, it's in the same directory, so we don't need to specify any, any folder names. And then we say, what is the name of the label, the target label? Uh, because that's the label we want to uh, uh, use as a target label. And then uh, we say, what, is, what are the names of the other columns? Um, sorry, it's the target column, which is also called label. And what are the names of other columns that specified or all the columns that specified in your iris headers? Once you do that, um, then it loads up the data set and it assigns column names to each of those columns. And it knows that the last column is our label column or target column that we need to predict, right? So in addition to that, now once we have a data set, we, when we are, before we're going to be doing training, we need to split that data set right into two parts. One part is used for training and one part is used for validation or, or test uh, data set as we call it. So that is done using the test train test splitter. And uh, we need to specify what is the percentage of uh, train test split we need. So in this case, we've selected it to be uh, 70, 30 percent. Um, and then I think this is your random uh, seed. That's why it's one. And now when you do enter, oh, sorry. So you can see the mistake I've made here. I haven't run the, the line above. So when I, when I run the line above and then I come here, 
And so now it has created this object called iris splitter. So now uh, once we have the data set split, uh, we still don't have it split. We just have it uh, marked for splitting. Uh, we need to still split them into two different physical data sets. And then we're going to do that with this line. And so if you see now, it has now split the 150 lines, 150 rows uh, data set into two parts, 105 rows for training and 45 rows for tests. And as I'd mentioned earlier, there are four features. It has already detected that because the way we have configured it earlier. And it already has seen, found out that those, the last column, which is the label column or the target column has got three different types of classes, right? So this is a multi-label uh, uh, classification problem. And now once we have this in place, the next thing we need to do is start training the model. So for that, we have um, the class called logistic regression trainer, which is based on, as you can see over here, linear, linear SGD trainer. Again, the classifications you can see further in the Java docs and in the project overview, in the, in the package overview. Uh, but over here, we're just going to be creating the trainer um, and we're just instantiating it. So we're not really, really creating the model yet. And now once we have instantiated it, you can see that what it's composed of, you can see this, the default seed is one, two, three, four. And of course you can change that. The epoch is already default set to five. Again, we can change that. We haven't done that. We're just using default values. So the only thing left now between us and the model is this line. Uh, all we do is we tell the trainer, train the, the model um, based on this data training data set. And then we're going to do that. And, and it is very quick in training because it's only 150 rows. And now the model is ready. Now, once the model is ready, how do we know the model is good, right? We don't know. So we have actually put aside unseen data, which is this test data set here. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply the unseen data on the model because the model has not seen the data in the test data set. And we're going to check how well does it think uh, it knows those flowers by their uh, four features. And so we're going to see that in a second or two, or even less than that. So you can see it has already done the classification for us and we can see the results. Now this table, because of, the, because of it being in the browser, it may not be um, very clear to see. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to switch to my slides where I've uh, done a bit of explanation on this. So as we look at this um, evaluation step, we can see that um, the table has got uh, groups of matrices or metrics. And so the first group has got the classification metrics with the number of observations per class, true positive, false, pos false negative, and, and false positive. And these mean that uh, given we show it one flower, does it know it is, it is that same flower or does it not know if it's the same flower and it thinks it's another flower? And we will see that in a second in the, in the uh, confusion matrix. Um, but this table will tell us how many number of classes it has got observations it has got per class, um, how many of them it has got correct, uh, how many of them it has got incorrect for various reasons. And based on those, these uh, columns, um, recall precision in F1 is also computed. And then also the accuracy scores are computed. Again, if you'd like to deep dive into any of these metrics, there's a link right at the bottom over here. It'll take you to the relevant page. Uh, let's look a little bit further um, how uh, recall precision and F1 scores are calculated. So recall precision and F1 scores are calculated from the true positive, false negative, and false positive uh, metrics. And you can see over here, the formula is very clear um, for recall and for precision. And the F1 score is computed based on uh, ratios between uh, precision and recall. And, and that computation gives us the F1 score. Again, if you want to know the details of this, uh, please have a look at um, the link at the bottom here. So um, that was the example on, um, let's get back to the uh, notebook. So this is the explanation to the, the classification uh, matrix table here. Um, we can also further print a confusion matrix, which uh, I was alluding to earlier. Uh, and the confusion matrix does an N by N comparison to, to show you uh, something like when the model was shown the right flower, did it recognize it? And how many times did it recognize it? Now, uh, again, if it, when it was shown another type of flower, 
how many times did it recognize it as the right type and how many times did it think another flower than itself and so that's where you get to see numbers outside the 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 in the other columns so for example over here uh, we can see that once in one instance when it uh, iris virginica was shown to the model it thought that it was iris versicolor uh, or versicolor uh, but it was was incorrect but uh, the other 14 instances it got it right and in the case of the other two it didn't get it wrong in any of the instances now you can see that makes sense because if you see our accuracy is 97 percent which is reflecting the confusion matrix here now it's not just this that uh, makes Trivio different from other libraries. Um, it also tracks, as I'd mentioned, uh, metadata. And one of the metadata is tracks uh, is on features and output domains. And so you can see that this is gonna be useful for doing explainability. We are not gonna go into the depths of it today in this presentation, but if you read further the docs and, and if you're familiar with with explainability and if you're familiar with Lime, you will know how useful this is. Similarly, I was talking about provenance earlier. So provenance is nothing but keeping track of all the activities and all the steps and all the metadata that's involving uh, right from the start. So we started creating the data set. So it has tracked all of this information about the data set, all the way from the classes that were used to all the parameters that were used, even the hash of the data set because if the data changes, the hash will change and we can check when we rebuild a new model, if the two models were built using the same data or not. And if they were not, there is likelihood that they might not be giving the same results and they're not the same model then. Similarly, there's provenance information tracked at the training level. And this is a lot more information than the data set level. As you can see, we use the logistic regression trainer and then all the other metadata about it is also uh, in here. Um, if you remember, we had an epsilon of zero one. Uh, it was using the Ada Grad uh, optimizer, um, and then the seed was one, two, three, four, five, and then um, also the epoch was five over here. And so this is really, really useful information. Now, not only does it provide you with this in in in, uh, in this string formatted form, so you can print it out on the, on the screen, but you can also save this as a JSON object and then you do these bit of Java ceremony to uh, create the JSON object. And as you can see, once you convert that provenance information, which we had earlier into a JSON file, then you've got all of your provenance information in a JSON file, which you can save and maybe load in another application uh, and maybe do something about it. In fact, uh, there are other examples where you can save the provenance information and then load it back again and either create the, and create the model again or uh, create a model to infer or create the model to train it further, whichever you want to uh, do. So let's look at, uh, this is gonna be just the string of the model itself. It's called Iris model. And you see it's not well formatted here, but uh, that's not the purpose of that uh, command. Uh, maybe there could be a, a two provenance string for that one as well. And similarly for the evaluation component, uh, you can also again create a, a JSON output of it or a string output of it. And that's going to give you all the metadata that it has collected. And this is really useful information. When you focus into things like explainability and reproducibility, you want to know how something was created. And, and when you have such in-depth information, you can do that much better. When you have such in-depth information, you can explain things much better. So that's kind of the end of the, uh, the, the demo on, on the notebook. Let's go back to our slides. Um, now I've put together, we are all familiar with writing uh, uh, applications that run on the, in the, on the command line or through uh, the browser or as a server app. Uh, in this instance, I, I just made a, a CLI based Java app, which is doing pretty much exactly the same as you saw in the notebook, but you can run that through the command line. And I highly recommend you go and try this out. The link is provided here. There are two things you can do there is you can build and run the jar file or you can build and run a Graal VM native image from the CLI instructions for that. All of that is provided. Um, in fact, if there is some time, I might even be able to show you this. So uh, I usually put this in my presentations whenever there's a demo involved. 
and this gets everybody thinking. So now that you've seen this for the last 30 odd minutes, um, you might have had questions in mind, but you might also have uh, found some new answers. Uh, but these questions are there to intrigue your thinking, to see what are the other things you can see in this library that are of use to use? What are the other things that could have been added to the library? Or how do you do something? How do you integrate it with another library? So some of these questions, you don't need to give me the answer to, but it'll be great that you think about it and maybe share it with others. Or if you have an answer to it, then maybe use that. Um, but also if you have more questions, then you can always come back to the GitHub repository and raise them as issues and have discussions there or on the discussion forum as well. So as I'd mentioned earlier, this example is available on GitHub. The link is uh, provided at the bottom there um, and you can go ahead and try it out. There's good documentation, hopefully. Uh, if there isn't, then always uh, feel free to ask me and I will uh, rectify them for you. Um, also want to let you know that there are other Java libraries as well that are ML based, not very many, like in the world of Python and R and other machine learning uh, frameworks. But um, in the Java world, there are a handful of them that you might want to know about. Uh, and recently, EL gave a talk on such libraries. He also briefly spoke about Trivio. So have a look at that presentation. Uh, similarly, Zoran wrote a blog post on his uh, machine learning library called DeepNets. Uh, and there's a couple of those blog posts there. Both of them are worth uh, reading and, and uh, understanding and, and trying out the code snippets. There's code snippets in the first one to try. Uh, I gave a couple of talks uh, earlier this year um, and even uh, last year about uh, these kinds of topics. And you might want to click on that link. Uh, later on today, there is a talk by Suash Choshi. He's going to be talking about uh, deploying machine learning uh, libraries uh, or models created for machine learning libraries on, onto the cloud. And that's also another talk that you want to go and watch to see other aspects of Java machine learning cloud and, and these related topics. So that'll bring us to release and licensing about the library. You might want to know how that goes. Uh, the latest release is tag version 4.0.1. Uh, of course, this will change uh, as time goes. Uh, we want the library to progress, of course. Um, the other thing to let you know is that uh, the library comes with a very developed and community-friendly license, which is we are all hoping that all, all the libraries we come across have this license. Uh, and in this case, we are lucky that this machine learning library has that. So it gives us more opportunities to step forward and, and contribute. Um, as I'd mentioned earlier, you have a discussion forum that you can subscribe to and listen or even contribute back by raising questions or joining a discussion. But you could also do that by raising issues on GitHub with your feedback or issues that you find or raise pull requests with your amendments, if, if any. Or maybe you want to integrate it with another library that'll be of great use to the rest of the community. Uh, there's also contribution guidelines that you might want to read first before you go ahead and create a pull request. And then there is a security reportings guideline as well. Uh, you'll see that many libraries don't take this into consideration, but for this specific library, there has been uh, care taken to bring that into, uh, into focus as well. So like any presentation or any endeavor, there's a lot of resources that uh, get collected in the process of preparing those presentations. And in this process, I have these uh, repositories and links for you that you might want to go through. Um, and this, these are starting points, of course, uh, but they will get you to some really useful points and hopefully you will learn a lot more than just this uh, 30 odd minutes presentation today. Um, I also have been doing some work both in the Java front and in the non-Java front in the Jupyter front as well. And I've put together a lot of the uh, code in various repositories and various uh, subfolders in this repository. Um, and I've put all these links here. There have been blog posts written as well on them. So these are 12 plus months worth of uh, coding and blogging work uh, that I've put together. In addition to that, there are other examples that I've brought in here. These are not written by me, but by others like NVIDIA and the uh, Oracle Labs and the Graal VM team from Oracle Labs. Um, so please have a look at them as well. 
So just to summarize, as you've noticed that this is a very unique approach to machine learning as opposed to all the other machine learning libraries, at least that I have seen and I'm hoping you might agree with me on this. Um, it's very much, uh, it produces predictions that are types instead of floating point arrays that I've seen in many machine learning libraries. Um, and the focus is on provenance, it tracks metadata. Uh, and, and what's the purpose of provenance? provenance? Provenance is for posterity reason. That means what have we done in the past? How have we done it uh, to keep a record of it? And also for explainability, once we have posterity, once we have a record of it, and once we understand what's been done and we can, re and we resonate with it, we can explain to others what uh, that is about. Um, but it also helps in recreating the model and not just the model, as you notice, it captures uh, metadata right from the first step to the last step. That means you can recreate the whole end-to-end -end flow with provenance information, with provenance metadata. Also, uh, if you've seen the security consideration given, and you know there could be lots of uh, areas of security failures during this process, uh, and I'm not saying there is, but that's something into uh, take into consideration. Uh, unlike other libraries, have not mentioned about it that I know of. Um, and this is a tried and tested library, as I mentioned. It's been incepted in 2016, so there's been a long time since this library has been tried and tested before it has been released to the public. It comes with a community-friendly license. I mean, what more can we ask for? Uh, and I'd also mentioned that we've only scraped the surface of it. I mean, there's so much to know and read and learn about just machine learning in the Java world. And then this library has got also a lot of depth in its uh, offering. And so we have not covered many of those things. We've only gone skimmed through the surface of it. And you will notice that from the slides, but when you see the links, you will see, you can actually go deeper and understand them even further and better. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, again, Urban, his team and you for uh, listening to this presentation and also making this event happen because without which all of us wouldn't be here uh, and, and you know, you, uh, you wouldn't be listening to me and I wouldn't have the opportunity to share with you this about this machine learning library uh, that's out there. And I'd like to also share some social media links to keep in touch with me uh, or to find out about my past works or any or keep track or follow my future works. Um, it's possible you've already looked into these and clicked on them and uh, it may not be necessary to talk about it again. And with that, I think we barely have any time for Q&A. Uh, I'll leave it to the organizers to decide if we can slide in one question. Uh, I don't want to delay the next speaker, but uh, okay. this is the great opportunity to ask one question that we can slide in in the 30 odd seconds we have. I see that the QA section is empty. I mean, the messages in the session. Um, so I would say thanks for the presentation. And if you have some questions, uh, write to Mani. And our next session is in five minutes. Sure, yeah, this is my um, Twitter handle and use the make it conf 2020 hashtag. Uh, and I will look for them uh, over the course of the day. Uh, hopefully I'll get back to you, but there's many ways to get uh, to reach me. Good. Thank you very much for listening to me and thank you for having me here. Um, without any further ado, uh, I will pass this on to you guys so you can pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you again. Thank you.